Okay, I want to thank everybody for coming again, and uh, it's really good to be here. I was uh, just thinking, looking at the pictures here, of the, the tree method, and the tremendous response I got from the emails. A lot of people wanted to be here. If all the people that could be, have been here were here, uh, this place would not hold all the people. There was so many people that were, uh, it, we did have four or five times as many people here. And so that's why we got Harold here and just, I'm very glad that we have the opportunity to uh, l watch and demonstrate hands-on the tree planting method uh, and learn wisdom. And so I think what we have here is some time where wisdom is being presented uh, and it, was, it came from uh, God that was given to revelation and then acted on and uh, we just really wanna pick up that as much as we can. So I'm gonna uh, discuss a little bit about some of the soil tests uh, that, that is in the garden right here uh, of Todd and Teresa's garden. I'm gonna look back at a couple years of history on it. Uh, before I do that though, I better set my timer. So, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm mostly gonna be over here working with a whiteboard here. Before I get into the specifics, you, you, have, um, you should have in your packet that Lynn gave the current soil test right now and recommendations. And you can also see what was just passed out, the recommendations and the, and the soil test from April of this year. So we can see some progress in her soil. Uh, before I get into that though, I wanna talk just a little bit about um, what is a plant. And some of this you may recognize from some of my emails that I sent out, but uh, it's very important that we look at and talk about what a plant is. And we're in the business of raising plants. And so um, a plant in its very essence is an energy accumulator. That's what plants do. They accumulate energy and they reformulate it. They reformulate energy according to their DNA pattern, their instruction code. And so if it's a carrot, it makes carrots and it ultimately wants to make carrot seed. And so um, the key word though is, is that word energy. Okay, so what are some of the sources of energy for plants? Let's just uh, list that out. What would you say, what are the different sources that the plants are gonna get for energy? Sunlight. Sunlight, that's great. That's number one probably. Another one. Water, that is gonna carry minerals. Uh, very important. Keep going. Electricity, yep, let's say atmosphere, we, we can say that, we can break that into two actually. Atmospheric uh, at, uh, electricity. And we also have uh, soil, electricity in the soil. So we actually got two. And soil electricity. What else? CO2 is a very important form. Carbons are, uh, carry uh, energy. So CO2, carbons. Other form of, uh, of energy. Fertilizers. Okay, anybody here of West Texas? And what happened in West Texas? Right, what happened was Two uh, forms of nitrogen, an ammonial form, which causes growth, and a reproductive form, which causes, uh, which is ammonia, am ammonial nitrogen, or put in one fertilizer pellet called ammonium nitrate. And so when you have this one going that way and this one, there's a lot of energy. And when there was a fire, it exploded and it, it blew up a town. So is there energy in fertilizers? Yes, in fact, that's what a fertilizer is. It's a concentrated package of energy. So that means you use them carefully. You use them judiciously. Okay, fertilizers. And anything else? Biology. Exactly, yes, biology. Bi they're very important. Anything else that you can think of that, that plants are accumulating from energy? Color? Color? Is that what you said? Color, so the electromagnetic spectrum. 
yes. Uh, and I would kind of probably put it under the electricity, but it is a spectrum of electricity. Okay, one other thing is soil magnetism. Magnetism, and uh, there, there's energy. I'm not great at spelling, so if it's wrong, that's my fault, but uh, uh, there's a lot of, the energy that moves a compass needle, that's energy flowing through the flow of, in the soil. Very important, can, the, can that be used to grow a plant? Yes. And then one other thing, uh, leaf applied minerals. So we also have, we have soil minerals and we have leaf applied minerals. And also on the leaf. So those are some different sources of energy that a plant accumulates. So I have a question for you. Does a plant make energy? No. no. It does not. It does not make energy. It follows the laws of physics. It does not make energy. Its job is to accumulate energy. So what's your job? Make sure there's enough energy from all of these sources and you'll have it growing abundantly, growing very well. Yes? Mycorrhizal are part of the whole biology. Uh, so um, I can answer that specifically. Mycorrhizae are very helpful in getting <laughs> phosphorus available to the plant in a low phosphorus soil. If you have an adequate supply of phosphorus that you need to grow a top quality plant, your phosphorus levels are kind of up here. And so that kind of puts the mycorrhizae to sleep. They're not that useful in a high quality soil. Okay? Because, but if in a low quality soil, or where you're just starting to with a garden and you need to bring your phosphorus up, mycorrhizae work very well. Okay. So, can plants move around to go get the energy they need? Just a little on their roots, but they're not going to be moving from here to there, right? So it's very, very important that we look at ourselves as very much complementary to a plant. We have to provide uh, the, the energy to the plant. And the other thing is plants don't pick up minerals except with moisture. So moisture is absolutely required for the upward movement of minerals up into the plant. And if moisture is tight, they're also very short on minerals. So letting a soil get really dried out, you're, you're, def delete you're, you're uh, mineral deficient as well in that plant. Okay, so the bottom line is we must keep the environment of the plant well energized. Uh, well energized, it, it, we, it, it's our job, we are the stewards. Okay, so this uh, little bit I wanna talk about is, is how we can do that. And, and what do we do is we, the areas that we have control, so we don't control the sunlight, there's some of those areas that we can control, some not, um, but we have to look at all of them. And sometimes we can impact them, but we can't control it. So uh, I, I've got three areas I wanna talk about um, and so this is how we help the plant. We want to feed the soil. Feed the plant. And feed the leaf. Now if you want, you don't have to do more than feed the soil. And there's been some debates in the past, you know, don't feed the plant, feed the soil. And other people say, well, feed the soil, feed the plant, feed the leaf. Uh, it, it really, you want, the more you do, the more you get back. So how much do you want back? So uh, you don't have to go beyond this one. And this morning, uh, I'm just, or afternoon now, sorry. <laughs> uh, the, this first session, I am gonna talk about feeding the soil. I'm gonna stop and take any questions if there is for right now. Any questions? Yes. When you're um, 
Okay, the comment was uh, he has uh, fed the soil by putting on nutrients in the soil, and when those were up and then he foliar fed, he saw some burning of the leaf. Okay, let me define first of all, feed the soil is you look at the soil test and you bring the ratios up and uh, you wanna work with the minerals that are available. Feed this plant is where you're actually keeping the conductivity up so that the energy of the electrical conductivity is up. So what you did is you put the plant, you put the energy up here and then it, it, it burned when you applied it. Okay, a couple things. If the sodium or something like that, which may be a non-nutrient is high, that can be an impact. So maybe there was some manure or some sodium, something that caused some sodium can add to it. Uh, if that wasn't the issue, then burning can come from applying a foliar spray um, wrong time of day, not too much humidity or too high of heat. Uh, sometimes it's just a little concentrated and you actually just need to dilute it down. Another thing is make sure you're using some dextrose to, it moderates the, the, the heat on that. It doesn't burn as much with dextrose and also use distilled water. Uh, then if that doesn't work, cut down the uh, amount of active ingredient and you'll get to the point where you can still foliar spray but not burn, okay? Any other questions? Yes? Are you gonna go into atmospheric? The question was, are you gonna go into atmospheric energy? That interplays a lot with foliar feeding. So we will go into foliar feeding. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we foliar feed is we wanna be able to access more atmospheric energy. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit more about feed the soil. Any other questions? Yes? I guess I was just about the other foliar should be cut in half. Yeah, the point comment was there's a number of different things to look at when determining if there was a problem with burning of the leaves. Um, one thing you want to have is a, is a conductivity meter, and then that'll tell you when not to add nutrients. Also it'll tell you when to add nutrients, and I'll, I'll be covering that tomorrow, uh, and we'll be demonstrating a little of that as well. Um, but if you over fertilize and your, your conductivity goes too high in the soil, then you have salts that are too high on the roots. And then when you put salts on the leaf, even kind of dilute, it can burn. So um, that's, um, we'll cover that again tomorrow. Okay, so I want to look at um, the sheets from uh, April. So we have a garden sheet. I think we had one passed out. And then there was some recommendations. And I'm just gonna go through and kinda, uh, just kinda give a little analysis on the first one. So we're looking at the main garden, and I believe that's Teresa's garden right out here is your main garden. Okay, and, is, and, and so um, looking at April, we had um, uh, a decent uh, starting point. Very good on the humus. Um, it's mid-range or so on the phosphorus, got a little excess of potassium uh, and needs to work on the calcium. So needs to work on the calcium and the, and the phosphorus, needs to avoid potassium and, uh, and then needs some trace minerals. So what we're doing with feeding the soil is we're trying to uh, follow, there's, a, there's an important rule when you feed the soil. You need to think of where's optimum? Where is optimum? So an important rule is optimize, let's see, rule number one. Optimize to ideal. So you look at ideal, where's ideal? In the calcium, in the phosphorus, potassium, and you try to give a dose that the soil can digest, you can't give everything. So uh, you cannot uh, give too much food to a kid so it skips a couple of years and all of a sudden it has grown more. And you just can't do that. You have to give according to what it can digest. And so we're optimizing toward ideal. So uh, anybody here have perfect kids? <laughs> yeah, me neither, so uh, not me. Okay, so we're trying as parents to work toward getting better kids. And we kind of have this ideal, you know, we should be obedient and all these other things, you know? So we don't ever achieve necessarily ideal, but we keep pushing to it. And in a lot of times, modern 
agriculture says, okay, what was taken off from the crop? This much of NPK and these trace minerals or whatever, and now put it back on. They're not referencing ideal. And so they're staying kind of where they're at in a pattern. Our goal is to change the pattern. We want soil that has adequate phosphorus and potassium and a good level of calcium so it can grow an abundance of high quality. And we do that by changing the ratio and the levels of the available minerals. So one of the things I always like to say is if you are making a cake and you cut the liquids in half, no, you cut the dry in half and you double the liquids, mix it up and stick it in the oven, what are you gonna get when you take it out? Some kind of soup, it sure won't be cake, right? Would you agree with me, ratios are important, okay? Salt to the other minerals and other things of the other ingredients in the food, that's a pretty important ratio in cooking, wouldn't you agree? Yeah? Ratios are very important in soil. It's not that we just stick a something onto the soil, okay, we got this, let's just put it on. We want to create the ratios that will grow the best quality food. Okay, now each crop is a little different. So we, for mixed vegetables, we kind of take it down the middle. If we're growing a single specific crop, then we're uh, okay to uh, really idealize that soil for that crop, okay? Question. What's your definition of a high quality food? A high quality food? Uh, a high quality food is that when you take a bite of this food, you got more minerals and nutrition, that the amount of minerals and nutrition is close to the optimum of that genetic for that package. Uh, okay, so if you eat an apple, it should be close to the, the maximum genetic potential. It doesn't have to be perfect, okay? And we want more nutrients per bite. That's my definition of nutrient-dense foods, more nutrients per bite. Okay, it's not that, okay, it's green, not, therefore it's nutrient-dense. That's not true. You can have low-quality kale, okay? All right, so um, I'm talking more theory, and I'm not talking much about this soil test here. So here's what we did. Looking at the first, um, um, in April of this year, i to check my time here. Okay, in, in April of this year, we had the first recommendation, or first soil test, and we wanted to really bring up the phosphorus and the calcium. So we put it really hard, soft rock phosphate for the um, phosphorus. And we added some commercial phosphate for the uh, additional. So make sure there was plenty for the growing crop right now. Now the goal is to take that phosphate, the 11520, out of the program. In other words, to bring the soil level to the optimum or just a little over, but not far over, and then take the commercial out. That's the goal. Okay, then we did, we worked on calcium by the limestone and the geocal. And we worked on specific trace minerals. And then we worked on broad spectrum trace minerals. That comes from the sea solids and the kelp meal. And there's some tra broad spectrum trace minerals from the geocal. So those are the main areas uh, we want to work on, uh, which is um, uh, calcium, biology, uh, major minerals, <coughs> Uh, traces, and then broad spectrum, broad spectrum. Okay, so the, by broad spectrum, I mean what are the minerals that aren't on this soil test, but they're still important. Iodine's not on this soil test, it's still important. So is a number of other elements. Okay, so we wanna have broad spectrum uh, rock powder. So again, it's calcium, biology, major minerals, trace minerals, and the broad spectrum. All of those we want to address with what I say, feed the soil, fixing the soil. And to begin with, if you notice, if you start adding it up, 40 pounds, 40 pounds, 10 pounds, it's about 113 pounds, which is a really heavy dose of minerals for 1,000 square feet. That's a heavy dose. 
but we're optimizing toward ideal and then we'll, it'll start to drop down. So the next, so now, earlier this month, we got another soil test. Okay, main garden, and that's September. Now, the pattern didn't change a lot, but the calcium went up. And here's what I notice. Soft rock phosphate is a little slow. There's a quite, there is quite a bit of phosphorus there, but phosphorus is a little unique in soil. If you, uh, if you have a very big dry sponge and you turn the sink faucet on and you just dribble it in, you're not gonna have water running off that sponge until the, sun, the sponge saturates. Then you'll get a runoff from that sponge. Phosphorus in the soil is a lot like that. You uh, put some out and you don't see any results. So in this soil test, we had 119 pounds available. The previous one was 131. We went down, backwards, right? Were we going backwards? Not really. It's just a little variation. But the first year, it did not show an improvement. But the soft rock phosphate does a very amazing thing. If you ever get it wet, soft rock phosphate gets sticky. And that is helping to provide magnetism in the soil. One of the things that it holds really good is calcium. So calcium is heavy, and if it doesn't get, if it doesn't get digested by biology, calcium will just go out of the root zone and go into the subsoil. Soft rock phosphate has got a, a stickiness to it that holds it, it attracts it, and it holds it up, and then it gives more time for biology. So you notice the calcium went up very good. And I see that pattern a lot. The first year you don't move the phosphorus, but the calcium made a great gain. That's a big improvement in the soil, okay? The phosphorus to potassium ratio did not move. So that ratio says there's going to be some struggle with broadleaf weeds. I don't know if Teresa can say that that's true. Oh, no, there was never a <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Okay, as that, P, as that P to K ratio changes from a 0.25 to uh, a one, you'll notice a change in your species of weeds, and it's the kind of weeds that are easier to get rid of, like uh, um, pigweed and um, lamb's quarter, for example. That'll, uh, but you'll notice that it's not so thriving. And the other thing you'll notice as the phosphorus and the, as the P and K ratios and levels get well, you'll see that the weeds get more insect damage, but the plants that you're growing do not. And that's always a really great thing. You feel like doing a dance around the garden when you see that happen. The weeds have got insect damage, but the regular plants don't, okay? Okay, so then we worked on the trace minerals. The trace minerals came up some, but essentially this soil's still in the same pattern from April to September. And so she did it t twice. So the, one of the guiding principles that I work with when I do recommendations is rule number two. So rule number one, you wanna optimize to ideal. Rule number two, um, don't apply what is excessive. And uh, the corollary, I'll just give that as rule number three, apply what is deficient. Apply what is deficient. Very simple, uh, but it's amazing how many people don't do it. Okay? There's a, I, I like to say people, soil needs what it needs not necessarily what you have to offer it, okay? All right, pretty important, very basic. Okay, and then the, the last thing that I work with is always apply the broad spectrum. Our organs need a lot of trace minerals. If we can get the calcium up, get the phosphorus up, that gives us healthy cells and 
higher quality. That plant has enough energy then to pick up the trace minerals. They're heavy, okay? So we need more trace minerals in our diet and we can pick up more trace minerals. Uh, so we need to put them in the soil. So now I'd like to just stop and take questions about any kind of questions you have about the recommendations or why we did what we did. Yes? John, uh, on, on your soil test, are they the same to say uh, Logan Labs or Sotestine or the, these labs? Are you using some of the same ranges as, as these guys use? The question was asked, is our soil test the same as Logan Labs or some of, the, some of these other people that are doing? And they, we have some similar ratios. The answer is no. We are not using the same soil test. We are using a very different test. And when I speak about ratios and ideals of ratios, I am not at all saying for any other lab. I'm only saying for our lab. The difference is um, back in a long time ago, 100 years ago almost, uh, Dr. Morgan started studying plant root exudates. And he found that they give off a weak acid, a kind of a carbonic type acid. So he did the same, he copied that and made what was called the universal plant extract. So he copied it, so that was became the first modern day soil test, okay? Since that time, they have modified the Morgan and then they've added a whole bunch of new ones, the Bray, the Olson the pho and for phosphorus, uh, and ammonium acetate, and a bunch of other ones. And now it's the Malik 3, and the Logan Labs is a Malik 3. And so there's a whole bunch of chemicals they put in with it. And, and so what has happened, after Dr. Morgan, the people that developed soil tests studied chemistry. Dr. Morgan studied plant roots. They studied chemistry. So now the soil tests that are out there now are answering the question, what's in the soil? Are they lying? No, it's there. It's truth. But we're asking a different question. What can the plant get? Very important difference. So what's biologically available to the plant? So that's why we're very different. If the ratios are there, some, some of the people have taken uh, Dr. Reams ratios. Dr. Reams worked with Dr. Morgan and promoted Dr. Morgan's tests. So it sometimes is called the Reams test. It's sometimes called the Morgan test. And sometimes it's a chemical company that manufactured it called the Lamont test. It's all the same test, but use the Morgan test because that's the guy that developed it. And that's kind of a, uh, the right name for it actually. Well, the question was asked, will those soil test results be the same depending, even if you have different soil test methods? Absolutely not. Plants don't read chemistry books. All they got is their one extract. They don't have six of them to get all the minerals out, okay? So definitely there's a difference, okay? Yes? Okay, so you can see that Therese did it twice in a year. Therese and Todd, well, they switched over to fall. And so I kind of like to, I suggest people to do it in the fall because it takes pressure off in the springtime. And we get really busy in the lab. Um, so normally in the upper Midwest, once a year is sufficient soil test. You don't need to do it more than that. Um, but if you're switching from spring to fall, then you could do two in a year and then just go fall to fall after that. Um, if you're in the south, I recommend, if you really got depleted soil, I recommend doing it right before each growing season and applying some minerals. And then once you bring your minerals up, then you can go to once a year. So fall is easier for logistics, um, but you actually might put the broadcast on in the spring. Yes? Is it practical to uh, plant in the lab? Question was asked, is it, uh, is it good to, to uh, sustainable, or is it good to do your own soil testing like the Lamont test? Um, you can, but the amount of need for it is only once a year, really. And so you can do what you want. Uh, it sounds very self-serving, so I'm gonna give you the honest answer. I think you're far better off sending it to a lab because it's, to get it done right is gonna be quite a bit of a cost and it's not really worth setting up a lab to do that. Yes? Uh, I don't know if this is... So the, your question, if I understand you right, was can you contrast what would, the type of soil test from Kinsey versus the, the, the International Ag Labs test? 
Uh, okay, uh, Kinsey's approach or is, is based on uh, William Albrecht, which is looking at uh, essentially how big is your bucket and how full is it? Okay, if I could uh, really, that's maybe too simplistic, but that's essentially what it is. And so then based on that, you, you, you put your bucket of the right amount in this ratio. And so they also work on ratios, um, but that calcium uh, may or may not be available to the plant. Okay, and so there is some difference. Um, Dr. Scow put it this way. They were, f they were contemporaries and friends. Reams and Albrecht were friends and contemporaries. They were, had no animosity to each other. But this is how Dr. Scow got it. Reams got bricks and Albrecht didn't. Okay. So I would say it a little more politically, you know, uh, Albrecht laid a great foundation. Reams took it to another level. Okay? My time is up and I don't know how strong I need to be on time, so I'm going to stop and see what, you ready to take over, Lynn? Take over, take questions, okay. Okay, well, uh, I had only half an hour, so um, I didn't talk much about nitrates was the comment. Okay, so one of the things that you do when you look at nitrogen, take a look at April and look at how much nitrogen was there. You had six pounds of nitrates and you had eight pounds of ammonia. So essentially, that soil was very, very low in uh, nitrogen. And if you look down to the electrical conductivity at 177, which is the ergs, that's very low. That is enough energy to get a seed out of the ground and start growing a seedling. It is not enough to grow a crop anywhere close to it, okay? So what did I do? I put down calcium nitrate and ammonium sulfate. Um, so one's a double growth energy. Calcium nitrate is a double growth energy. Ammonium sulfate is a double reproductive. Now we're getting short in sulfates in our soil, so we need more sulfates. Okay, um, now, so that started the energy. It was enough to begin, and then it was able to carry on with the nutrient drenches, perk up and OND. So that's again, perk up has calcium nitrate, OND is fish-based, so it's got more of a reproductive protein form of nitrogen. And so growth energy, reproductive energy, back and forth. Okay, and now as you enter the end of the season, we now have 281 ergs, or conductivity. That is still a little, that's low, but it's a lot better. So it still needs to be, uh, keep on using the, the drenches to keep the energy up. And I did not put a recommendation for calcium nitrate here because it's going into the fall and the nitrogen doesn't really last over winter from calcium nitrate. So it's a 